Out of the Dust, Part 5 On the Road with Arlie Here's the way I figured it. My place in the world is at the piano. I'm earning a little money playing, thanks to Arlie Wanderdale. He and his Black Mesa boys have connections in Keys and Goodwill and Texoma. And every little crowd is grateful to hear a rag or two played on the piano by a long-legged, red-haired girl, even when the piano has a few keys soured by dust. At first, Ma crossed her arms against her chest and stared me down, hard-jawed and sharp, and said I couldn't go. But the money helped convince her, and the compliment from Arlie and his wife Vera that they'd surely bring my Ma along to play too if she wasn't so far gone with a baby coming. Ma said, okay, but only for the summer and only if she didn't hear me gripe how I was tired, or see me dragging my back end around, or have to call me twice upon a morning, or find my farm chores falling down, and only if Arlie's wife Vera kept an eye on me. Arlie says my piano playing is good. I play a set of songs with the word baby in the title, like My Baby Just Cares For Me and Walking My Baby Back Home. I pick those songs on purpose for Ma, and the folks that come to hear Arlie's band, they like them fine. Arlie pays in dimes. Ma's putting my earnings away, I don't know where, saving it to send me to school in a few years. The money doesn't matter much to me. I'd play for nothing. When I'm with Arlie's boys, we forget the dust. We're flying down the road in Arlie's car singing, laying our voices on top of the beat, Miller Rice plays on the back of Arlie's seat, and sometimes Vera up front chirps crazy notes with no words, and the sounds she makes seem just about amazing. It's being part of all that, being part of Arlie's crowd I like so much, being on the road, being somewhere new and interesting. We have a fine time, and they let me play piano too. June, 1934. Summer, 1934. Hope in a drizzle. Quarter inch of rain is nothing to complain about. It'll help the plants above ground and start the new seed growing. That quarter inch of rain did wonders for Ma, too, who is ripe as a melon these days. She has nothing to say anymore except how she aches for rain at breakfast, at dinner, all day, at night. She aches for rain. Today she stood out in the drizzle, hidden from the road and from Daddy, and she thought for me, but I could see her from the barn. She was bare as a pear, raindrops sliding down her skin, leaving traces of mud on her face and her long back, trickling dark and light paths. Slow tract of wet dust down the bulge of her belly, my dazzling ma, round and ripe and striped like a melon. July, 1934. Dion Quintuplets. While the dust blew down our road, against our house, across our fields, up in Canada, a lady named Elzire Dion gave birth to five baby girls all at once. I looked at Ma so pregnant with one baby. Can you imagine five, I said. Ma lowered herself into a chair, tears dropping down on her tight stretched belly. She wept just to think of it. July, 1934. Wild Boy of the Road. A boy came by the house today. He asked for food. He couldn't pay anything, but Ma sat him down and gave him biscuits and milk. He offered to work for his meal. Ma sent him out to Daddy. The boy and Daddy came back late in the afternoon. The boy walked two steps behind in Daddy's dust. He wasn't more than 16, thin as a fence rail. I wondered what Livy Killian's brother looked like now. I wondered about Livy herself. 
Daddy asked if the boy wanted a bath, a haircut, a change of clothes before he moved on. The boy nodded. I never heard him say more than yes, sir, or no, sir, or much obliged. We watched him walk away down the road in a pair of Daddy's mended overalls. His legs like willow limbs, his arms like reeds. Ma rested her hands on her heavy stomach. Daddy rested his chin on top of my head. His mother is worrying about him, Ma said. His mother is wishing her boy would come home. Lots of mothers wishing that these days, while their sons walk to California where the rain comes and the color green doesn't seem like such a miracle. And hope rises daily, like sap in a stem. And I think someday I'm going to walk there too, through New Mexico and Arizona and Nevada. Someday I'll leave behind the wind and the dust and walk my way west and make myself to home in that distant place of green vines and promise. July 1934. The Accident I got burned bad. Daddy put a pail of kerosene next to the stove, and Ma, fixing breakfast, thinking the pail was filled with water, lifted it. To make Daddy's coffee, poured it. But instead of making coffee, Ma made a rope of fire. It rose up from the stove to the pail, and the kerosene burst into flames. Ma ran across the kitchen, out the porch door, screaming for Daddy. I tore after her. Then thinking of the burning pail left behind in the bone-dry kitchen. I flew back and grabbed it, throwing it out the door. I didn't know. I didn't know Ma was coming back. The flaming oil splashed onto her apron, and Ma, suddenly Ma, was a column of fire. I pushed her to the ground, desperate to save her, desperate to save the baby. I tried, beating out the flames with my hands. I did the best I could, but it was no good. Ma got burned bad. July, 1934. Burns. At first, I felt no pain, only heat. I thought I might be swallowed by the heat, like the witch in Hansel and Gretel, and nothing would be left of me. Someone brought Doc Rice. He tended Ma first, then came to me. The doctor cut away the skin on my hands. It hung in crested strips. He cut my skin away with scissors, then poked my hands with pens to see what I could feel. He bathed my burns in antiseptic. Only then the pain came. July 1934. And I think we'll pause here and continue reading this next time. Thanks so much for listening. Love you guys. Tigger says ta-ta for now.